Hey everyone, this is Dr. Ben Thompson with Treble Health. I'm joined by Dr. Michelle and Dr. Tracy, and we're here today with our tinnitus research update. This is a new series that we're doing monthly called Sound Science. Today's video will talk about two new and exciting studies and how they can help you manage tinnitus. So we're trying to look at the most cutting edge research and bring that straight to you so you can learn in an easy to understand, easy to comprehend way, even if this is very technical information. So I'm going to start by introducing article number one. Article number one is called Tinnitus Treatment with Oxytocin, a pilot study. Did you know that oxytocin nasal spray is a synthetic version of the hormone oxytocin? And that's important for controlling food intake, weight, as well as other elements of our health. Oxytocin nasal spray is approved in Europe, but not in the United States other than in clinical trials. Today's research is about oxytocin nasal spray and how it can be used to manage tinnitus. This was completed by researchers and ENT, ear, nose, and throat clinics in Brazil. The objective of the researchers was to evaluate the potential of oxytocin as a tinnitus treatment. There were two studies performed here with the oxytocin study. Study one was a long-term open pilot study, while study two investigated short-term effects with a double-blinded placebo-controlled study. The setting was at ENT clinics in Brazil. The first oxytocin study looked at 15 patients over a 10-week period. The second oxytocin study looked at 16 patients in a placebo-controlled period just after a single dose of the nasal spray. Who was included in this study? Only patients older than 18 years with a continuous perception of tinnitus of at least six months duration were included. We'll put on the screen right now an example of what the nasal spray for oxytocin looks like so you can get an idea of what these individuals were using during this trial. Keep in mind, don't get too excited. This is a research trial. It's not yet available in the United States. This is a short interruption from today's video to announce the tinnitus quiz. Are you frustrated by your tinnitus? Does it affect your ability to concentrate or fall asleep? If you're ready to find lasting relief from tinnitus, visit tinnitusquiz.com to get personalized solutions and treatment techniques to help you manage your symptoms today. Let's now talk about the results from the oxytocin tinnitus treatment pilot study. For the long-term study, study one, analysis revealed that there was a decrease in tinnitus sensation, both for the tinnitus handicap inventory and another questionnaire that was used. Also, the short-term effects in study two, with just a single dose of the nasal spray, revealed a significant reduction in tinnitus because of the oxytocin nasal spray. That was measured through different questionnaires about tinnitus. The researchers concluded that these preliminary pilot studies demonstrated that oxytocin may represent a helpful tool for treating tinnitus and further larger controlled studies as warranted. Dr. Tracy and Dr. Michelle. What do you guys think? I think that's an interesting study. And I've heard of others in the U.S. that have been looking at oxytocin nasal sprays as potential tools for helping tinnitus, primarily because it affects hormone release. And oxytocin is usually called like the love hormone or like the bonding hormone, both for like sexual and non-sexual type of relationships. And I think that the social relationships that we engage in both, um, somatic and romantic really play a large role in how we feel overall. And we know that they can also help to reduce stress and anxiety, help us to feel better, help enhance mood. And those are all things that have a powerful impact in a, in a positive way on tinnitus. So I think that it's really interesting to look at that. I would be more interested to learn if they looked at what the oxytocin levels were like at baseline for these individuals who noticed a benefit after using the nasal spray, because I think then that may be an indication that that might be a potential future test that individuals who have tinnitus may have done in order to see if this would be a possible treatment option for them to see, to determine whether or not their tinnitus can improve by using the nasal spray. One of the things that I like about this study, I think obviously there needs to be, you know, more data collected. It's a, it's a small population that was involved, but I think one of the things in terms of tinnitus treatments that often comes up in, in conversations is, you know, is it low risk? Is it relatively low risk? Is it non-invasive? You know, and obviously in addition to the, the actual treatment effects. So I think from looking at it from that perspective, I think this is something that has promise for patients. If the 
uh, further studies show, you know, similar results that it's likely to be relatively low cost, low risk, non-invasive. So it's something that would hopefully be available to more patients, right? So something that's not super exclusive, that would be more accessible to to a broader population of, of tinnitus patients that you know are looking for treatments. When I looked at the details of the changes of tinnitus in the study one, which was over a multi-week period, uh, even though there were improvements, it wasn't that good of a response on the tinnitus handicap inventory, which is a more universally used questionnaire. The other questionnaires they used did show some significance, but in terms of clinical tinnitus experts, it's it's hard to compare really and have much hope for those treatments because the questionnaires they're using to measure the study, they're not really universal like tinnitus functional index. So study one, the, the science isn't showing that positive, that dramatic of an improvement in the long-term use of the oxytocin nasal spray. Whereas study two also you know, it's great that they showed a significant difference compared to placebo because we always want that whenever possible. And only medication in the tinnitus world, it seems like only medication-based approaches can truly be measured double blind because whenever there's sound therapy or electrical stimulation, you know, bimodal stimulation, it's very hard to have a control group. So things like Odo 313, for example, there was a true control group. And that's what actually allowed us to cancel that and say, hey, it's not working compared to placebo. So we're really happy that we will find out if they develop more and more into this research for tinnitus, we'll have an answer like we did for Odo 313. Does it work compared to placebo or not? Because what you're spraying in your nose, you can't really tell if it's oxytocin. And uh, Dr. Tracy, I did look up some side effects of oxytocin. Too much oxytocin can result in everything from watery eyes and a runny nose to more severe issues, including uterine bleeding and seizures. So it seems like for most people, the side effects would be mild, but of course, this needs to come from a doctor. This needs to be prescribed. This isn't something that we want anyone to try to go find on their own and try for their tinnitus. Absolutely. Yeah. It needs to have a very, you know, it would need to have a pretty strict protocol as far as, you know, how, how much, how often, and all of those other details um, to make sure that it's safe. It's not something that we would recommend to, to try to get on your own and just, you know, self-treat for sure. Yeah. So we're not recommending it to our patients at this time, but we are monitoring it and we hope to uh, update you all later with more studies on oxytocin here in our sound science monthly reports. And I just wanted to add that there's a lot of research looking at oxytocin and in different applications for anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder. So again, when we oftentimes hear patients say, why is there not a single cure for tinnitus? It's because there's so many different factors. But what's interesting is that if oxytocin does seem to be a, a viable option to help manage tinnitus, it probably has a lot more to do with maybe some of the emotional and mood factors that start to change as a result of it, seeing as it's being applied to these different types of other areas where of individuals who are suffering from different things like anxiety, stress, depression, um, PTSD. Our second article for our sound science update is titled Tinnitus Does Not Interfere with Auditory and Speech Perception. It's coming out of UC Irvine and Fan Gang Zhang's lab. So him and his colleagues, they were looking at the idea that a lot of patients tinnitus patients will say that um, external sounds can sometimes mask their tinnitus, or they feel like it interferes with their perception of speech and other auditory incoming stimuli. So the idea that, you know, tinnitus is filling in the temporal gap, um, tinnitus is inducing actual hearing difficulty. It's something that we hear a lot in clinic. And so they wanted to look at that further. In their study, they were looking at comparing performance in temporal spectral uh, masking and speech and noise perception tasks between 45 human listeners with chronic tinnitus, and then comparing that to 27 um, normal hearing listeners without tinnitus. So they controlled for factors such as age, hearing loss, and stimulus variables. And they discovered that their results showed that contradictory to sort of this widely held assumption, tinnitus does not interfere with the perception of external sounds in 32 of the 36 um, listening measures that they performed as part of their study. So I think the takeaway from this study, the researchers concluded that tinnitus does not impair the perception of external sounds, even though a lot of patients will say that they feel like their tinnitus is interfering with their ability to hear. I think this busts the myth that, by and large, tinnitus causes hearing loss or tinnitus causes difficulty understanding people when there's background noise or understanding people's voices. You know, 33 out of 36 individuals means the vast majority of people might have trouble because of the concentration factor with hearing speech. 
but in terms of their raw ability for the sound to come in through their brain, through their ears, eventually to their brain, the tinnitus does not cause a temporary hearing loss when the tinnitus is loud, even if the tinnitus is loud. So I think this is a good thing for the community because it means, hey, I know it's hard to hear people sometimes when your tinnitus is loud or when it's distracting, but you really can. So try to focus. And for a vast majority of people, this means, hey, you're going to be okay. Tinnitus can be distracting but it's not a deterrent for you to enjoy social situations. I feel that this also highlights the importance of having a hearing test because we know that the majority of individuals who have tinnitus have some degree of hearing loss. And if we have hearing loss, even to a mild degree, even in just one ear, we know that there's going to be auditory processing declines or issues. And a lot of that has to do with your ability to focus or ignore auditory information And it can make it harder for one to to concentrate, to pay attention to something that they want to focus on if they have another auditory stimulus that's kind of relaying in their ear or in the case of tinnitus that they're hearing in their ear or mind. So I feel like it's a good indication that you should possibly get a hearing test done, consider auditory training, because if you do kind of enhance your ability to process auditory information, you may also notice that you're having less difficulty hearing. I also, when I was listening to Dr. Tracy describe this, it made me think of how many patients would, when I was you know, testing them in the booth, would say, hang on, I have to put my glasses on so I could hear better. Mm-hmm. And the fact that we really need to have sometimes enough sensory inputs in order to be able to do our best. Or on the flip side, I would be testing patients and they would have their eyes closed because they're really trying to focus and concentrate on all the sound, all the sounds and kind of block out anything else that might distract them. So it's, it's interesting because I can relate this a lot to everyday experiences and experiences that I've seen testing patients in the booth when they're trying to focus on sounds. Absolutely. If this was helpful, let us know in the comments. If you have any suggestions for next month's sound science episode, let us know. Big shout out to Dr. Tracy and Dr. Michelle, and we'll see you guys soon. Thanks.